Greetings, fair listeners, and thank you for joining me once again as we celebrate stories and storytelling in all their forms and the bards and artists who bring them all to life. I am the Tale Collector and your host, Erica Adams. In my humble opinion, nonsense and fiction can be a little fickle. There's a very fine line between delightfully random and inanely disjointed. And yet the great irony of it all is that, even at its most absurd, some of the best fictional nonsense still follows at least some rules in order to effectively tell its story. Perhaps nowhere is this truer than in the case of the granddaddy of literary nonsense, Lewis Carroll's Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. As silly as this book is, it still works partly because of the episodic format of its chapters. Moreover, smaller bits that are introduced but never fully explained, if at all, are acceptable because they are interesting enough to engage the audience while being minor enough to be abandoned without disrupting or ruining the overall narrative. That being said, there have been countless tales that have since attempted to further explore some of those bits. One tale in particular revolves around a single burning question. Just who exactly is Mary Ann, the servant girl for whom the White Rabbit had mistaken Alice? Tommy Kovac and Sunny Lee Yu offer their answer in Wonderland. Released as six single-issue comics beginning in 2006, and then compiled as a full graphic novel in 2008, and recommended for readers 13 and up. The inhabitants of Wonderland are still reeling from the chaos and destruction wrought by the creature now dubbed the Alice Monster. Indeed, the Queen of Hearts is in an even fouler mood than ever. But thanks to some hints from Tweedledee and Tweedledum, who are trying to weasel their way out of an execution, she now has the perfect scapegoat on which to vent her rage, her very own Herald, the White Rabbit. After all, why was the monster trying so hard to find him? And just what exactly was she doing inside his house? As it just so happens, Mary Ann, the rabbit's obsessive-compulsive but unfailingly devoted housemaid, returns to her master just in time for the queen to brand the rabbit a traitor and give her infamous order. Off with his head! And now Mary Ann finds herself on the run along with him. As she strives to keep both their heads on their shoulders, Mary Ann comes to learn not only more about the notorious Alice monster, but of the curious, a mysterious cult that worships her and who now wish for the similar-looking Marianne to finish what the monster began and dethrone the criminally insane queen once and for all, no matter how reluctant she is. Having been published by Disney Press, the art style of Wonderland is heavily influenced by that of Disney's animated film version of Alice in Wonderland. But the key difference between Liu's illustrations and the frames of the 1951 film is the former's much more visually blatant wackiness. Colors range from washed out to very bright, its patterns as erratic and unpredictable as many of the comic panel's shapes. The characters have highly exaggerated anatomies, with stick-thin limbs and huge bulbous heads and bodies. And this is even when they're not mutating from inhaling shrinking dust or sampling growth-inducing mushrooms. There's also Liu's sketchy outlines, which give the environment a very scratchy and squiggly appearance, both insubstantial and solid at once. This works especially well during some of the more action-filled scenes in that the ensuing chaos makes the characters appear even less physically defined than usual, further emphasizing the bizarre nature of this world. Along with all the original characters, like the proper, though paranoid, White Rabbit, the devilishly cheery Cheshire Cat, and the tea-crazed March Hare and Mad Hatter, Kovac introduces us to some new ones, like the long-lost Queen of Spades. As skinny and serious as the Queen of Hearts is fat and fanatical, she provides much of the backward thinking and pun-filled wordplay that Carol's work is known for, made all the more hilarious here because of her brutally blunt, stone-faced delivery, as if from a chronically irked Easter Island statue. Pages 70 to 71. If you're to be my maidservant now, you will have to learn a few simple rules of behavior befitting a girl of your station. First of all, you should slouch a bit and stand pigeon-toed. A proper lady-in-waiting is quiet and polite. When she must speak, she does so softly and keeps her mouth mostly shut. Have the decency to look at the ground and twiddle your thumbs nervously. When I call for silence, you shall bring me bushels and cartloads of it. I wish to acquire great storehouses of silence so that I never run out of it. Skipping to page 76. Mary Ann gazes curiously at the King of Spades, who is sitting on a rock in drowsy silence a few feet away. Why does your husband say nothing? 
she asks the Queen of Spades. He is my mate. We share our thoughts, our dreams, our opinions, our voice, and right now I am using all those things. But our primary new character is our young protagonist. Part of what makes this story so fun are the many ways in which Marianne, arguably the most human resident in Wonderland, treats all the ridiculousness around her like just another day at work, as it were, while still portraying the kind of insanity that makes even the other Wonderlandians seem sensible by comparison. Her greatest quirk, and weakness, being her absolutely frenetic obsession with cleanliness. I think the White Rabbit puts it best when she gathers up all the filthy dishes from the Mad Tea Party for a dangerously good scrub with an immense beam on her face. Page 92. Can't you do something about her? asked the Queen of Spades, thoroughly annoyed. In a resigned tone, the White Rabbit answers. It would be a shame to make her stop. She's so happy when she's scrubbing something to within an inch of its life. But it is through Marianne's reactions to Alice and her infamous deeds that Kovac really paints for us a picture of her character. It's almost as if, as soon as the White Rabbit admits his mistaking Alice for her, Marianne is cursed to be constantly compared to her in almost every way from that moment on, and not only because of her appearance. Pages 21 through 22. The Cheshire Cat leers at Marianne and the White Rabbit. Seems you've been incriminated, Bunny Rabbit, for suspicious dealings with the Alice monster. The white rabbit stammers. But I... Monster? What's this about? asked Marianne. His hands waving frantically, the white rabbit explains. While you were gone, there was an imposter here. She wrecked some of the rooms and shot the groundskeeper out of the chimney like a pea out of a pea shooter. I thought she was you at first. Marianne puts her hands to her chest, looking deeply hurt. Thought she was me? Well, she was a girl like you, and was wearing some sort of dress and she had some sort of hair on her head. I don't know. I suppose I was distracted at the time. Marianne looks at herself in the full-size mirror. Am I that nondescript? I know I'm just a maid, but... The more Marianne tries to distance herself from any association with such a troublemaking monster, the more we see how similar they really are to each other. Much like Alice, Marianne does her best to be reliable, honest, helpful, and obedient but she also isn't afraid to speak her mind when she believes something isn't right. Plus, it really is funny to hear an insane person calling what we would consider a sane person insane. Try saying that five times fast. Pages 95 through 96. The Mad Hatter addresses Marianne and the White Rabbit, the latter frowning with his hands on his hips, while the March Hare pours himself another cup of tea. You know, we had another young lady come by for tea just a little while ago. That was before she outgrew herself and ended up in court. Might she be a friend of yours? So, the Alice monster was here too, was she? Says the White Rabbit. The March Hare puts a sideways hand to his face. You know, they say she's been sighted in Looking Glass House. But don't tell the Queen of Hearts. She has followers now, who call themselves the Curious. Why would anyone follow a monster? Asks Marianne. Putting a hand to his chin, he answers. There are those who quite like the way she called the Queen's Guard nothing but a pack of cards. And she's not afraid to call nonsense when she sees it. The Mad Hatter retorts, Oh, poppycock! That would be like yelling sky every time you look up! Feather, Marianne's living feather duster, flies up as he chips in. I think this Alice monster sounds more interesting all the time. Marianne responds angrily, I think she sounds terrible and rude. If every girl were a back-talking, stuck-up little prat, Wonderland would be a jagged place indeed. Also like Alice, just because Marianne is a little girl subject to the whims of powerful, quote-unquote, adults, doesn't mean she appreciates insults to her intelligence and dignity. And just because she's a servant doesn't mean she is never curious about the world around her, wondering how it might shape her and her future. 
Even in a place where logic is said to have no place, she only wants what any other logical person would want, to be herself. Pages 118 to 119. Marianne and Feather wander the dust desert, making their way through the scattered and half-buried furniture. So, in this dream you had about the Alice monster, was she doing all sorts of savage, exciting things? asks Feather. Marianne does her best to explain. Well, not really. It was both strange and dull at the same time. In her world, the animals all went about naked, and none of them talked at all. Even the flowers were silent. There were kings and queens, but they were just regular stupid gets. But I, I mean Alice, lived in a big beautiful house, and she had more pretty dresses than you can imagine. She never had to wash or mend, or scrub the floors, and nobody told her what to do, at least not much. And when they did, she didn't have to listen. She sounds spoiled. Boy, that'd be the life, eh? Feather remarks. Marianne tucks her hair behind her ear, looking thoughtful. I suppose... She had two sisters, and she was prettier than either of them. But she had nothing to do all day, except look at herself in the mirror and play with those creepy silent animals. Skipping to pages 124 through 125. Marianne looks at the ground glumly. The white rabbit tries to encourage her. Oh, Marianne, I think you'd be delightful at rebellion. It would be so orderly and tidy. Marianne smiles gratefully at the white rabbit. Thank you, Master Rabbit. That means a lot to me. And doesn't every girl want to be a queen or a princess? The white rabbit asks. Marianne gazes into the distance with a small smile. I have my dreams, like any girl, I suppose. But I think I really just want to be humble little Marianne. As a side note, I kind of wish the title was different, as it doesn't feel very original, nor does it do its narrative justice in either description or engagement. But oh well. Truth be told, I personally wouldn't recommend readers getting into this graphic novel unless they've at least seen Disney's animated film beforehand. Although, I think being familiar with both the film and Carol's novel would help readers get the most out of it, because there are specific elements from both versions found throughout, and knowing those would help make the experience more enriching, and certain segments and cameos, for lack of a better way to put it, make more sense. Not unlike many contemporary stories based on fairy tales or century-old classics, Wonderland is much more plot-driven, with more fleshed-out and relatable characters than the story that inspired it. And yet it beautifully retains the poetic nonsense that made the original Alice so beloved. Liu takes the visual elements of Wonderland and exaggerates them even further. And Kovac very creatively expands on Carol's characters, especially one who is literally nothing but a name before, while not forcing too much unnecessary depth on them. If the Wonderland that came before has never been known to sweat details or take itself too seriously, then there's no reason why this one should, at least to an extent. And in the end, for all the right reasons, we don't have to care in the slightest. Gather on next time for another tale you may have forgotten or have never heard before. Until then, listeners, may inspiration always find you. <laughs>